Hello students, today's topic is deglutition and physiology of stomach. In today's class, you will be learning about deglutition, also known as swallowing, the phases of deglutition and the disorders related to it. Then, functional anatomy of the stomach, then various functions of the stomach, then physiology of gastric juice secretion, in that you will be learning about composition and regulation of gastric juice, the various phases of gastric juice secretion and lastly the applied aspect. Now let us see what is the definition for deglutition also called as swallowing. So swallowing is the process by which food moves from the mouth into the stomach. There are various stages of deglutition. The three stages of swallowing or deglutition are oral phase, pharyngeal phase and esophageal phase. Now in the oral phase of deglutition, the food which you eat, it moves from the mouth to the pharynx. In the second stage of pharyngeal, uh, that is the deglutition, that is the pharyngeal stage, in that the food moves further, that is it moves from the pharynx to esophagus. And in the last stage of deglutition, that is esophageal stage, in this stage, the food moves from the esophagus ultimately into the stomach. So let us see one by one about the three stages of deglutition. The very first stage of deglutition is the oral stage. Now this is a voluntary stage or a voluntary phase. Here focus on picture A. Here you can see in the oral phase, that is, it is the first phase of swallowing and it is voluntary. That is, you can control the actions which are happening in this phase. Now, during this phase, the bolus of the food, this blue color that is representing the bolus of the food. Now, the bolus of the food which is formed after chewing or the process of mastication is placed over the dorsum of the tongue here and the tongue forces the bolus into the oropharynx. So, in the oral stage, the food is placed inside the mouth, it is chewed properly and then the tongue helps to push the bolus into the oropharynx. The second stage of deglutition is the pharyngeal stage. This is an involuntary stage that is you intentionally cannot control the activities which are going to happen in this stage. Now the pharyngeal stage is an involuntary phase and which is caused by a swallowing reflex. Now before knowing the various events that take place during the pharyngeal phase of deglutition, uh, let us know about the swallowing reflex. So the pharyngeal stage consists of a uh, sw swallowing reflex. So like any other reflex, here also the components of swallowing reflex are, it consists of receptors, these receptors are present around the pharyn pharynx, especially over the tonsillar pillars, which are stimulated by the movement of bolus from the mouth into the pharynx. Now, the second is efferent arc. Second component of the reflex is the efferent arc, which, uh, which is formed by the fifth, ninth and tenth cranial nerves that carries the impulses from the receptors to the deglutition center. Now, the third component of the reflex is the deglutition center or the controlling center. It is located in the medulla oblongata and the lower pons of the brain and it coordinates the reflex activities. The last component is formed by the efferent arc and it is comprising of the 5th, 9th, 10th and 12th cranial nerves that initiates a series of muscular contractions of the pharynx and tongue. Now let us see what are the events that occur during the pharyngeal phase of deglutition. Uh, please focus on the diagram B. So after the bolus enters the oropharynx during the first phase of deglutition, the oral cavity is now shut off from the pharynx by approximation of the posterior pillars of the fossas. Now the nasopharynx is closed by the 
upward movement of the soft palate and which prevents the regurgitation of the back or the back flow of the bolus into the nasal cavities the vocal cords are also strongly approximated that is joined together and thus the it stops respiration temporarily this temporary stoppage of breathing during deglutition process is known as deglutition apnea now the larynx is pulled upwards and anteriorly by the neck muscles that enlarges the opening of the esophagus all these activities which i mentioned they guide the bolus of the food towards the esophagus and prevent its entry into the trachea just before the bolus enters the esophagus the otherwise tightly closed upper esophageal sphincter relaxes and opens up to allow the entry of bolus into the esophagus and once the bolus enters the esophagus the vocal cords again open and normal breathing resumes the entire process of pharyngeal phase is completed within very small time period that is of one within 1 to 2 seconds and the deglutition apnea thus goes unnoticed by the person the third stage or phase of deglutition is the esophageal stage it is also an involuntary stage now during this phase the food bolus is propelled or moved forwards from the upper part of the esophagus towards the stomach by a process known as esophageal peristalsis peristalsis is nothing but the alternating contraction and relaxation of smooth muscles of the git that pushes the food towards the anal or the aboral end now here two types of peristaltic contractions can be seen during this stage the first is primary peristaltic contractions and the second is secondary peristaltic contractions or peristalsis now the primary peristalsis esophageal peristalsis is initiated by the act of swallowing itself as soon as the bolus enters the esophagus the primary esophageal peristalsis begins and that propels or moves the food downwards towards the stomach the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes to receive the bolus into the stomach by the process called as receptive relaxation now after primary esophageal peristalsis is over if some food is left into the esophagus this will initiate the secondary esophageal peristalsis or the secondary peristaltic contractions it is coordinated by the intrinsic nervous system of the esophagus and it sweeps all the remaining food towards the stomach now come to the applied aspect of the topic deglutition uh the disorders of swallowing which will be seen as an applied aspect for this topic are mainly two disorders first one is cardiac achalasia or the achalasia cardia and the second one is gastroesophageal reflux disorder let us see one by one achalasia cardia is a neuromuscular disorder that affects the lower two third of the esophagus it is characterized by the absence of esophageal peristalsis and failure of the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter during swallowing thus as a result what happens the food cannot go forward from the esophagus into the stomach and it causes accumulation of the food and dilatation of the proximal part of the esophagus achalasia cardia can occur due to the damage to the local mantric plexus of that part of the esophagus or it can be due to defective release of the uh, vas uh, local va dilator agents like vaso active intestinal peptide and nitric oxide the absence of these two that is vip and nitric oxide will cause increased resting tone of the lower esophageal sphincter and thus it will not open when there is food now what is the treatment the treatment is pneumatic dilatation of the lower esophageal sphincter 
that is pneumatic means air so high air pressure is given to dilate the lower esophageal sphincter or secondly the process by a process known as myotomy is performed it is a surgical procedure in which there is incision uh, is made on the esophageal smooth muscle to relax it and the third is use of botulinum toxin injections uh, which are given to the lower esophageal sphincter to prevent the release of acetylcholine and to relax the lower esophageal sphincter the second disorder related to swallowing is gastroesophageal reflex disease or gerd now gerd is also known as incompetent lower esophageal sphincter that is here the problem is with the lower esophageal sphincter that is normally closed but in this condition the lower esophageal sphincter will be not tightly closed it will be very loosely closed and that will cause reflux of acid contents uh, into the esophagus during digestion so due to the incompetency of the lower esophageal sphincter during digestion when the person uh, eats food and the food gets mixed in the gastric juice that acidic reflux will cause regurgitation into the esophagus via the open or the loose lower esophageal sphincter now what are the conditions that can cause or which are associated with gastroesophageal reflux disorder the conditions can be any pyloric sphincter disease it can lead to the formation of uh, gerd or people who are having bad lifestyle like obese people especially who are always lying down uh, or they uh, people who are having full meal and sat and then going and lying down uh, immediately now third is hiatal hernia people who are having hiatal hernia they will also suffer from gastroesophageal reflux disease and it it also occurs temporarily during pregnancy due to the increased growing uh, mass of the fetus that causes a uh, discomfort and just after delivery this condition is cured but in the above three conditions that needs certain treatment now what are the clinical features of gerd the clinical features for acid reflux will be heartburn or pyrosis pyrosis is the painful burning sensation one gets now second can be esophagitis that means inflammation of the esophagus repeatedly excoriation of the esophagus by the acid gastric acid will lead to inflammation of the esophagus and will cause esophagitis now third is dysphagia that is difficulty in swallowing now fourth is cough and change of voice in severe cases later cases when the other parts of the thorax are also involved a uh, cough can occur and voice changes can be occur due to the uh, effect of the recurrent lar laryngeal nerve can be damaged and it can cause changes with the voice and lastly esophageal ulcers can develop and ultimately it can lead to esophagus cancer of esophagus now the next topic is physiological activities in stomach stomach is a hollow muscular organ made up of smooth muscle consist of four parts the first is cardia that is the uppermost part which is in contact with the esophagus the second is just adjacent to the cardia known as fundus the third is the body and the fourth is the pylorus which comprises the pyloric antrum and the pyloric canal the volume of stomach is normally 1 to 2 1.2 to 1.5 liter and the maximum capacity of stomach to accumulate food or liquid is up to 3 liters here you can see a diagram which shows the gross anatomy of the stomach so here you can see the lower esophageal sphincter the esophagus is ending at the level of lower esophageal sphincter and from there the first part of the stomach arises that is known as the cardia now this dome shaped part just adjacent to cardia is known as the fundus now this entire part the largest area of the stomach is known as the body or the corpus now here you can see a constriction which is the pyloric antrum 
it is entirely the pylorus which consists of pyloric sphincter and the pyloric canal now ultimately from the pylorus the it goes and joins this first part of small intestine that is the duodenum as you all are already aware of the fact that the entire gastrointestinal tract is more or less made up of four layers starting from inwards towards the outwards namely mucosa submucosa muscularis coat and consisting of the smooth muscles and the serosa similarly stomach is also made up of all four layers now what is special about the stomach is that the smooth muscle layer is made up of three different arrangements instead of two as you can see in this diagram the stomach has an outer longitudinal layer and then as you go inside you can see the middle circular smooth muscle layer and most inside you can see the oblique smooth muscle layer the stomach and duodenum are divided by a thick circular muscle layer known as the pyloric sphincter the inner surface of the stomach shows a coarse arrangement called as this rugae these folds are these are rugae these are nothing but the folds of mucosal and submucosal layers of the stomach here inside this mucosal layer of the stomach you will find millions of gastric pits that contains many gastric cells and glands namely the surface foveolar cells the mucus neck cells and the glandular cells the glandular cells form the gastric glands and there are three types of gastric glands so first one is main gastric gland second is cardiac tubular glands and third is pyloric or the antral glands now let us see uh, what is main gastric gland the main gastric glands are basically present on the body and the fundus part of the stomach the alveoli of main gastric glands has got two types of cells the first type of cell is chief cells also known as peptic cells or zymogen cells now these chief cells are basophilic in nature and they secrete pepsinogen 1 and pepsinogen 2 the second type of cells called as parietal cells and also auxentic cells so parietal or the auxentic cells are the second type of cells which are present in the main gastric glands these parietal cells are acidophilic and they are responsible for secretion of hydrochloric acid and the intrinsic factor the second type of gastric gland are cardiac tubular glands these are present on the mucosa of the cardia part of the stomach and they are responsible for secreting soluble mucus the third type of gland is the pyloric or the antral glands these are as the name suggests these are present at the antrum and the pyloric region of the stomach these glands contains again two types of cells mucus cells that produce soluble mucus and g cells that produce a very important gastrointestinal hormone gastrin now this here is the diagram showing the microscopic histological view of a cut section of the gastric mucosa so here you can see this is the mucosa of the stomach which is arranged in a typical pattern here you can see the gastric pits these are the pits gastric pits and the entire mucosa is lined by surface epithelial cells these these are the surface epithelial cells purple color ones and called as enterocytes in between the enterocytes here you can see this fluorescent green color you can see various types of cells some are mucus neck cells here these are the parietal cells these are the chief cells so this is overall the structure of a, a histological structure of the gastric mucosa which contains all the three types of gastric glands now let us learn about the functions of stomach functions of stomach can be divided into various categories the first category is mechanical and or the motor functions of the stomach so first under that heading is the storage function so you all know that stomach helps in uh, storage of food for around 3 to 4 hours until the digestion process completes now slowly from the stomach 
it is uh, the food or the chyme is emptied into the intestine and so that proper digestion and absorption can take place can take place so stomach acts as a reservoir for food for 3 to 4 hours now second mechanical function of stomach is formation of chyme now the peristaltic movements of the stomach mixes the bolus of that is uh, present in the stomach with the gastric juices and thus it helps in formation of a chyme which can easily pass along the pass along further into the intestine the second function of stomach is digestive functions now uh, these are also the functions of gastric juice so what are the functions digestive functions or the functions of gastric juice first is uh, small amounts of foods are digested in the stomach so small digestion takes place in the stomach let us see one by one in the stomach pepsin which is an enzyme released by the chief cells this pepsin converts the proteins it helps in digestion of proteins so this pepsin converts the proteins into smaller elements like proteases peptone and polypeptides this pepsin also converts the milk protein casinogen into casein now the gastric lipase which is again a component of the gastric juice it converts the fats present in the bolus into it breaks the fats into fatty acids and glycerols now the gelatinase degrades the gelatin and collagen component of the food into peptides the urease acts on the urea and converts it into ammonia and lastly the gastric amylase helps in the digestion or degradation of the carbohydrate that is starch stomach also has some absorptive functions although very little absorption of nutrients takes place in the stomach but only highly lipid soluble substances like non ionized triglycerides are absorbed in the stomach ethanol that is alcohol is also rapidly absorbed in the stomach now fourth function of the stomach is the protective functions these are also the functions of the gastric juice stomach consists of many mucus producing cells in its mucosa this mucus which is alkaline in nature protect the stomach from irritation and mechanical injuries especially the insoluble mucus protects the gastric mucosa from digestive action of hydrochloric acid and pepsin by forming a gel like coat called as the mucosal bicarbonate barrier the mucus secreting cells also secrete bicarbonate in large amount and thus along with the mucus it forms the mucosal bicarbonate barrier that protects the gastric mucosa from excoriation the fifth category under the functions of stomach is the functions of hydrochloric acid this is also the functions of the gastric juice now hydrochloric acid which is present in the gastric juice it performs various functions firstly it activates the enzyme pepsinogen into its active form pepsin and that helps in protein digestion now second function of hydrochloric acid is that it kills some bacteria that enters the stomach along with the food so it has got bacteriolytic action also now hcl also provides optimum acid medium for the action of hormones and also for digestion now fourth function of hcl is it helps in iron absorption by helping it convert from the ferric form into ferrous form so whenever the non heme iron which is in the you know, usually in the ferric form it has to be converted into ferrous form so that it can be easily assimilated by the body the sixth set of functions is hemopoietic functions these are also the functions of gastric juice now hemopoietic functions are that th that is the chief cells of the stomach secrete very important intrinsic factor of castle and this intrinsic factor plays a very important role in erythropoiesis so it is necessary for the absorption of vitamin b12 uh, that is intrinsic factor should be there 
in the absence of intrinsic factor there will be no absorption of vitamin b12 and that will lead to deficiency of vitamin b12 and ultimately cause pernicious anemia the last functions of stomach is excretory functions now stomach uh, helps in elimination or excretion of many toxins alkaloids and metals via the gastric juice composition of gastric juice gastric secretions can be broadly divided into two types the first is the gastric juice or that is the exocrine secretions of the stomach and the second is the endocrine secretions of the stomach that is the gastrin hormone now composition of the gastric juice the gastric juice contains around 99.5% of water and only 0.5% of solid elements the volume of this gastric juice is that it is 2 to 3 liters of gastric juice is secreted by the stomach per day the reaction is highly acidic this juice is highly acidic in nature and the ph is around 1 to 2 here is a diagram that shows the composition of the gastric juice the gastric juice as i have already told in the previous slide that is is made up of 99.5% of water and 0.5% of solids now this uh, what are the solid elements the solid elements comprises of organic substances and inorganic substances so the gastric juice contains inorganic substances like hydrochloric acid sodium calcium potassium bicarbonates and chlorides and phosphates now the organic substance uh, of the gastric juice are divided into enzymes and uh, other substances like intrinsic factor and the mucus the enzymes which are present in the gastric juice are pepsin helps in protein digestion the renin which is only found in animals not in human beings gastric lipase that helps in a little bit of fat digestion and urease and gelatinase secretion of gastric juice secretion of gastric juice can be broadly divided into two two parts first is the secretion of pepsinogen by the chief cells and second is the secretion of hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells now the pepsinogen as you all know is secreted in as an inactive form by the chief cells and which is ultimately activated into pepsin by the presence of hydrochloric acid now come to the important part that is secretion of hcl or hydrochloric acid various theories are there which explains the origin of h plus ion of hcl but the widely accepted theory of mechanism of hydrochloric acid secretion is the davenport theory it is an active process and can be understood better under two headings the first is secretion of hydrochloric uh, hydrogen ion and uh, second is the secretion of chloride ion before going to the details let us first see this diagram of a parietal cell the parietal cell are present at the mucosa of the stomach it has a broad part that is called as the basal lateral membrane and that is directly in contact with the interstitial fluid and also it has got a narrow part which is called as the apical membrane and which is facing towards the gastric lumen the basal lateral membrane consists of two types of pumps namely the sodium potassium pump and the bicarbonate chloride pump and there is one pump which is present on the apical membrane that is called as the hydrogen potassium atpase pump all or the proton pump this parietal cell contains large amount of mitochondria and also a special enzyme that is carbonic anhydrase now let us come back to our topic mechanism of secretion of hydrochloric acid so the first part under this heading is secretion of h plus ions that is how h plus ion is produced inside the parietal cell and excreted into the gastric lumen now here you can see that h2o and co2 which are already present inside the parietal cell they combine in the presence of carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid now this carbonic acid which is formed 
it quickly dissociates into bicarbonate ion and H plus ion and then this is H plus ion reaches the apical membrane of the parietal cell where the this hydrogen potassium ADPase pump or the proton pump actively removes it from the inside to the outside that is into the gastric lumen and the energy for this activity comes from the hydrolysis of ATP which is uh, supplied by the mitochondria. One important note that must be taken into consideration is that the antacids like uh, antacid drug like omeprazole or other proton pump inhibitor drugs they inhibit this proton pump that is working on the apical membrane and thus they block the H plus secretion and thus they relieve the acidity of the stomach. Now you know how the H plus ion which was formed that was actively transported into the intracellular canaliculi or the gastric lumen by this proton pump in exchange for potassium ions. Now let us see what happens with the bicarbonate which is formed along with it. The bicarbonate ions that were also formed are transported via the basement membrane of the parietal cells with the help of an another antiport which is operating that is the bicarbonate chloride antiport. Thus along with the increased amount of H plus secretion there is also increased amount of bicarbonate ions into the blood after having a meal. This phenomena is known as postprandial alkaline tide. Now let us see how the secretion of chloride ion takes place into the intracellular canaliculi from the parietal cells. Inside the parietal cell now there is high negativity compared to outside. This is due to the normal activity of the sodium potassium pump that is pumping 3 sodium outside and taking only 2 uh, potassium ions inside. Also the potassium ions taken inside it diffuses out of, out of the basolateral membrane through the potassium channels and thus all these reasons makes the inside of the parietal cell more negative compared to outside. Thus due to this increased intracellular negativity the chloride ion which is uh, negatively charged is forced out into the lumen via the chloride channels from a concentration of higher uh, concentration to lower concentration. Ultimately the chloride is forced out via the chloride channels into the intracellular canaliculi and here this chloride combines with the already secreted hydrogen ion to form concentrated HCl. There are factors that affect the hydrochloric acid secretion. The factors which stimulate the HCl secretion are vagal stimulation or stimulation of the vagus nerve gastrin hormone and histamine. All this they cause stimulation of HCl secretion. Whereas the factors which cause inhibition of HCl secretion are low pH of the stomach that is whenever the pH of the stomach is less than 3 by negative feedback mechanism HCl secretion is stopped. Now second is the intestinal influences under the secretion of certain hormones like secretin, cholecystokinin. Again the HCl secretion is inhibited. Third is secretion of somatostatin and fourth is secretion of prostaglandins and other growth factors like epidermal growth factors. These all uh, will cause inhibition of the HCl secretion. Now let us discuss about the regulation of gastric juice. Regulation of secretion of gastric juice can be broadly divided into neural regulation and chemical or humoral regulation. The mechanisms regulating the gastric secretions include neural control and chemical control. The neural control over the gastric glands is exerted by a local enteric 
nervous plexus that involves the cholinergic neurons and impulses from the central nervous system via the 10th cranial nerve or the vagus nerve. The vagal stimulation or vagus nerve stimulation always causes increased secretion of hydrochloric acid and pepsin from the parietal cells. This vagal response can be abolished by vagotomy that is cutting both the vagus nerves and also by the use of anticholinergic drugs such as atropine. The chemical or humoral regulation of gastrin, gastric secretion involves various gastric hormones and mechanisms. The first amongst them is the role of gastrin hormone. The gastrin hormone is produced by the G cells by the G cells also known as the Apert cells or the amine precursor uptake and decarboxylation cells. This gastrin hormone is released by the G cells into the blood circulation either due to the vagus stimulation or due to the distension of the pyloric antrum by the chyme or food. After releasing this gastrin hormone enters the arterial circulation and it reaches the stomach and where it stimulates the parietal cells and the chief cells to secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor respectively. Here in this diagram, you can see how gastrin and other hormones act on the parietal cells to cause various effects. The gastrin hormone binds with a special receptor called as cholecystokinin beta receptor or the gastrin receptor present on the parietal cells and once the binding occurs the uh, calcium channels open up and this releases large amount of intracellular calcium and this calcium along with the cyclic AMP acts on the protein kinase C and activates the proton pump and thus H plus ion is secreted and the normal acid secretion takes place. Just like gastrin, histamine also stimulates gastric acid secretion. Histamine is released by enterochromaffin cell like cells or the ECL cells form, uh, found in the base of gastric glands. These ECL cells have receptors for both gastrin as well as acetylcholine. Now in this diagram you can see the enterochromaffin like cells that secretes histamine. Now whenever ECL cells are stimulated it releases histamine and this histamine binds with a special receptor called as histamine receptor or H2 receptor which is present on the parietal cells to activate protein kinase C and ultimately secretion of H, uh, HCl takes place from the activation of proton pump. One important note that you all should take into consideration here is that the H2 receptor blocker drugs like simetidine or ranitidine they act on this H2 receptor site and blocks the stimulatory effects of the histamine on the parietal cells and thus there is no secretion of acid in the stomach. Now next is the role of somatostatin. Somatostatin has got an inhibitory effect on the hydrochloric secretion. It is a gastrointestinal hormone that is secreted by the D cells of the gastrointestinal mucosa and sometimes pancreatic islets. Somatostatin inhibits the gastric acid secretion either acting directly on the parietal cells or indirectly by inhibiting the gastrin producing G cells. Apart from these hormones, there are also little role of negative feedback mechanism of the stomach pH and intestinal influences that regulate the gastric acid secretion. Regarding intestinal influences, one must remember that whenever chyme containing acid, fats and products of protein digestion reaches the duodenum that is the first part of the small intestine, it causes release of several intestinal hormones like secretin, cholecystokinin and gastric inhibitory peptide which reduces the gastric acid secretion. Let us see the various phases of gastric juice secretion. Meal-related gastric secretions can be divided into three phases. 
namely the cephalic phase gastric phase and the intestinal phase the cephalic phase uh, contribute about 45% of the total gastric juice secretion and it starts when the food enters the stomach the secretion of gastric juice in cephalic phase is initiated by the sight smell taste or even thought of food the cephalic phase of gastric secretion is vagally mediated phase that is it is controlled by the vagus nerve here the signal originates into the cerebral cortex and appetite centers of amygdala and hypothalamus of brain these signals then reach the dorsal motor uh, dorsal vagal nuclei and from there the vagus nerve carries these signals into the stomach and thus gastric juice is secreted strong emotions uh, sometimes can influence or affect this mechanism for example anger will cause increased gastric secretion and gut motility whereas fear and depression can cause decreased gastric secretion and gut motility now the second phase is the gastric phase by the term itself you can understand that this phase is activated whenever the food enters the stomach it is of long duration when compared to the cephalic phase and it also augments the cephalic phase approximately 50% of the total gastric juice secretion occurs in this phase gastric phase is stimulated and mediated by local gastrointestinal reflexes and response to gastrin the third and the last phase is the intestinal phase here in this phase secretions of certain substances begin as the chyme begins to empty the stomach and move into the duodenum this phase is an inhibitory phase that causes inhibitions of the gastric juice secretion that is hcl and intrinsic factor and this phase causes the release of hormones like secretin cholecystokinin gip somatostatin etc let us see the applied aspects now the most important applied aspect of stomach which needs your attention is peptic ulcers the peptic ulcer is defined as an excoriated area of stomach or intestinal mucosa which is caused due to the breakdown of the mucosal epithelial layer by the gastric juice the most common sites for the occurrence of peptic ulcer is within few centimeters around the pylorus what is the etiology and pathogenesis of peptic ulcer the peptic ulcer can be caused by either two ways one is the mucosal bicarbonate barrier disruption that is the destruction of the protective mucosal bicarbonate barrier or due to hyper secretion or excessive secretion of gastric acid both of this can lead to formation or development of peptic ulcers here in this diagram you can see the most common sites for the development of peptic ulcer it is mostly seen around the pyloric antrum and around the lower esophageal sphincter the first and foremost cause for peptic ulcers is said to be the disruption of mucosal bicarbonate barrier there are various substances that are believed to disrupt the this barrier and that causes irritation of the gastric mucosa these causes are first is helicobacter pylori infection or h pylori infection around 70% of patients with peptic ulcer have shown history of chronic infection with h pylori bacteria this bacteria inhibits the somatostatin and intestinal bicarbonate secretion and also relaxes certain digestive enzymes that liquefy the mucosal barrier ultimately leading to formation of peptic ulcers other factors that disrupt the mucosal barrier are consumption of alcohol smoking and excessive use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like aspirin ibuprofen etc therefore one can see increased incidence of peptic ulcer in patients who are taking 
non steroidal anti inflammatory drug for long time the next cause for the development of peptic ulcers is hyperacidity or excessive secretion of gastric acid by the stomach human body produces two types of pepsinogen pepsinogen 1 and pepsinogen 2 it has been found by research that patients with congenital increased levels of pepsinogen 1 have five times more incidence of suffering from peptic ulcer in other cases patients develop hyper responsive state to hormone gastrin and thus a little gastrin hormone also produces tremendous amount of hcl production and ultimately development of peptic ulcer sometimes few patients also suffer from a condition called as zollinger ellison syndrome that is responsible for excessive hcl secretion and peptic ulcers this syndrome is seen in patients with gastrinomas that is they have tumors that secrete gastrin like hormone these gastrinomas can occur in stomach duodenum and pancreas now the commonly employed measures for the treatment of peptic ulcers are first patient can be given a full antibiotic course for the eradication of helicobacter pylori infection secondly proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole can be given to suppress the acid production thirdly h2 blockers like ranitidine cimetidine etc can be tried to block the effects of histamine next is antacids like gelucil are also given to neutralize the already present acid in the stomach sometimes bismuth compounds are also given to enhance the mucosal bicarbonate barrier but it is it has been reduced the use has been reduced due to certain serious side effects sixth is cytoprotective agents can be used like sucralfate prostaglandin analogs like misoprostol these are preferred nowadays and also along with it some conservative measures has to be advised to the patient like quitting smoking alcohol consumption and adapting a healthy lifestyle and lastly in severe cases of peptic ulcer uh, surgical interventions may be needed the most common surgery which is performed to treat peptic ulcer is bilateral vagotomy that is cutting off both the vagus nerve and combined with resection of the gastrin producing part of the stomach thank you